Well, since the beginning of January, we've been exploring some of the fears that we have in life. Some of the things that we face in the uncertainty of life, things that can threaten our physical well-being, things that can threaten our emotional and our spiritual well-being, things that can um, just cause us to have some suffering in life. And, and one of the things that we've learned um, as we've kind of made this journey uh, together, exploring our fears and looking at our fears, um, is that fear is natural. Fearing things is perfectly natural and normal. In fact, um, the ability to fear is a gift from God. God gave us the ability to fear as kind of an early warning system so that whenever we experience something that can be a threat to us in any way, physical, spiritual, emotional, our body is letting us know that there's something we need to pay attention to and we may need to separate ourselves from so that we'll be okay. Fears are perfectly normal and being afraid of things is perfectly natural and rational. The other thing, though, that we've learned is as we've talked about our fears a little bit, sometimes what is a rational fear becomes an irrational fear. And when our fears become irrational, they turn into anxieties that sometimes overwhelm us. And sometimes our fears get so big and so powerful and, and so overwhelming um, that, that instead of saving our lives, the, the ability to fear becomes something that takes life from us. And so when that happens, we want to be able to sort out what's real, what's rational, what's irrational, and, and how we can kind of discern the difference, how we can turn down our fears so that we can manage them, and how we can kind of um, press through them. Now, we've talked about a lot of things over the course of the last couple months. Um, if you've missed one of our worship services on a Sunday morning, I encourage you to go to our website uh, and, and find the, web, the sermon series there and just look at the, at the topics that we've covered. We haven't covered every topic of fear that you may have in your life, um, but if, 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 the, if something you're worried about is on that list, I want to encourage you to listen to the message and, and, and see the message of hope that you may be able to find there because in each week, each thing that we've looked at so far, We've been able to find a way to live with less fear, more hope, and more courage, no matter what we face in this often uncertain world. Now, as our series um, uh, nears its end, we've, we've, we've saved kind of three of the biggest fears that people have um, to talk about. And so far, we, we've talked about the, the fear of getting sick. Uh, we've talked about the fear of growing old. Um, and today, we're going to talk about the fear of dying. Now, if, if life goes as we hope life will go, right, we are going to grow old. We are going to get sick, and we are going to die. Th this is perfectly normal, and it's perfectly natural, and, 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 and we can't stop it, and we, and we can't change it. Um, it is part of what it means to be alive, and it's part of what it means to be human, and so today, we're going to kind of look at what some people, we're going to look at what some people consider to be that ultimate fear, um, that the fear of death, and, and how do we push through that, and, and what does it mean for us, and where's the hope and courage that we can find as we face our own mortality? And again, I, I do want to be very clear about what we're talking about today. Today, we're talking about our death, my death. We're not talking about the fear of someone else's dying or, or the fear of death in general. We're talking about confronting and dealing with any fears that we may have around our own mortality. The first thing that I want to say about that is something um, really quite obvious. You know, it's okay to be afraid of dying. It's perfectly fine and perfectly rational um, to fear death. Um, after all, we've been created to stay alive and to fight for life. And, and so the idea of death is something that our body is going to resist, um, that, the, that the way we've been created is going to resist. It's perfectly normal for us to feel some anxiety, some worry, and even some fear about death. It's normal. It's rational. And, and I want to let you know it's okay. And we welcome those fears into this place today. What, that, what can happen, though, with this rational fear of death is the same thing that we've already talked about that can happen with any fear that we have. When a fear becomes irrational, when it becomes overly present in our life, when it creates worries and anxieties beyond what we might consider to be the norm, then, then those fears and anxieties, um, they, start to, they start to impact our life in very negative ways. And for some of us, we at times find ourselves so afraid and so worried and so anxious about our own death that we start to focus on that um, at the expense of focusing on the life that we're living right here and right now. 
And so it's important for us to talk about this fear, to talk about how we can live with courage and hope in the midst of it, and and today, ultimately, to talk about the hope that we have um, through our faith and through the grace of God that that we know to be true um, through Jesus Christ. Um, one of the things that, that we've talked about, and this is true with every fear, every fear, when we, no matter what the fear is that we're dealing with, there's some steps that we can take um, to approach and work through those fears, to get kind of the other side and keep them um, kind of in check a little bit. And the first thing, the first step, always, 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 is just to name our fear. And, and I know that it, uh, initially that sounds kind of simple, but, but it can be hard to name our fears because naming fears, it, it takes vulnerability to name our fears. And, and one of the temptations we may have when it comes to our fear of death is just to say, yeah, I'm afraid of death. Let's leave it at that. Well, okay, but I think there's some other stuff that might be going on there. There might be some other fears that are playing into that, some, some fears that, that are underneath the surface that we need to uncover and talk about because if they stay underneath the surface, I think they're just going to continue to eat at us and, and work at us. And so we just need to name them. As I was thinking about today's message, I, I was thinking about um, the story of Ed Dobson. Uh, Ed Dobson was a pastor at a very large church uh, when he was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, and that was a ter- that's a terminal diagnosis. And when he received that diagnosis, he had to step down from his position as pastor. Um, and one of the things he chose to do, though, was to share his story, the story of the end of his life, um, through a series of videos. And it's called Ed's Story. And we, we, we showed them in worship uh, when they came out. It is a beautiful profound and hope-filled series of videos um, that covers the topic of death and dying and the hope we have in the face of it in a way that no Sunday morning sermon could ever do. Uh, If you weren't with us or if you haven't seen uh, any videos from Ed's story, I want to encourage you to watch them. Uh, On our sermon page, which is already up this morning, the sermon's not there, um, but the page is there, and on that page, we put a link to the first video segment of Ed's story. It's less than 10 minutes long. These videos are 10 to 15 minutes long. Uh, if you haven't seen them, I, I cannot recommend enough that you go and watch them. They, they're absolutely beautiful and speak to this issue in some really important ways. But one of the things that Ed Dobson talks about is he says right up front, he says, I'm not afraid of being dead. It's the getting dead that I'm afraid of. Um, and I, yeah, I, I'm with you, Ed. Um, I, I'm not going to necessarily say that, we, we, that none of us fear um, being dead. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it's the getting dead, uh, I think, that a lot of us have some fear and some anxiety about. Um, we, just, we rightfully wonder um, about our death. When will it happen? How will it happen? Will, will I know it's happening? Will I, will I be able to prepare for it? Will, will it be a, a slow death? Will it be a rapid and sudden death? Will, will, will I get sick? Will it be an accident? Is it going to hurt? Am I going to be afraid? Am I going to be alone? Right? I mean, these are very real fears that that you may have about what it looks like when your life comes to an end. It's, It's not so much the being dead. It's the getting there that causes you fear. Maybe your fear of death is not about the being dead or the getting dead. Maybe your fear of death has to do with the people that you might leave behind. You know, this is a, this is a real fear for a lot of us. Um, we worry about our partners. We worry about our spouses. We worry about our children and our grandchildren, our communities, the people that we love. Um, all of us experience this, this, this worry about what it means for us to leave others behind when we die. Um, but it's particularly acute for, for those who are responsible for raising children. Um, whether, they're, uh, whether they're your children, your grandchildren, or children that you're just in charge of and, and, and helping to raise, we worry, are they going to be okay if something happens to me? And, and that's a real fear, the fear of what my death means to those that I leave behind. And maybe, maybe that's a fear that you've got. Maybe that's a fear um, that you are working through. Um, maybe your maybe your your fear of death is um, you know it's uh, what it means for, for people beyond just your immediate family. You know what does it mean for your job? What, what does it mean for your community? What does it mean for your church? Um, as as something happens to you, are they going to be okay? And what does it mean for the what does it mean for the world to go on without me? How do I deal with that? 
You know, I've talked with a lot of people as they talk about their fear of death, and one of the fears they have um, isn't the people, just the people they live behind, and isn't the process of getting dead. It, it's actually what happens after they die. You know, some of us are worried um, about how God's going to respond to us when we die. You know, we hear a lot about God's grace and the promise of eternal life, um, but sometimes, and maybe this happens for you sometimes, we wonder, have I been good enough? How's, how's the ledger sheet working out for me? Um, are there enough good things to compensate for the brokenness and the hurt and the pain and the sin of my life? Um, is God's grace going to be enough to cover even a person like me? And some people worry. Uh, in fact, one, one of the fears people have when it comes to death is they fear God. Now, next week, we're going to talk, we're going to end this series up by talking about the fear of God. Because in a lot of ways, I think that is an ultimate fear. And, and, and we're going really, to really speak to that next week. So if you're worried about how God's kind of keeping score and, talk and, 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 and regarding you as you face your own death, I really want to encourage you to come and be with us next week because we're going to talk about that um, in, some, in some greater detail. Uh, I've also talked with some people who are just worried that when, we, when they die, that's it. You know, that, that there's nothing there, that, that all, this, all this faith that they've had and all this hope that they've had in Jesus Christ, that it, that it turns out not to be real. Now, maybe you've shared some of these fears. Maybe you have some of these fears. Maybe you've got some fears about your death and about how it will happen and what happens after that I haven't mentioned. Um, but here's, here's the thing that, that I just want to encourage you to do when it, comes to, when it comes to starting a journey of working through your fear about dying. Be honest with yourself and name the fears. Name what's behind the overarching fear that you may have about your life coming to an end. Because it's only by kind of drilling down and figuring out what it is that we can start to work through it. And while we may not be able to erase our fears entirely, we can start to turn down the fears a little bit and the volume of them a little bit. Now, once you've named your fears, um, again, as it, as it, as it, your fear of death, again, is the same as it is with any other fear. Once we name it and we know what it is and we've owned it, then a very helpful next step is to talk to someone else about it. Someone that you trust, um, someone that you know, someone that you can count on, um, someone that you can just sit down and work through some of your fears and some of the things that you want to talk about um, when dealing with your own mortality. Um, now, look, I know that that can be a very difficult conversation to have, and it's not a conversation that people typically look forward to. Uh, they recently did a survey in Britain, and 80% of those surveyed said they'd rather not talk about it at all. They do not want to talk about death. Um, and... You may be sitting here this morning profoundly uncomfortable because we're talking about death. It, it can be hard to do, but it's really important that we talk about this. And there's some very practical reasons why this is so important. Because here's what we know can happen. If someone is so afraid of death that they're afraid to talk about it, then sometimes that fear can bleed into a lack of preparation for doing the kinds of things that can help us turn down the anxieties and worries about our own death. For example, some people are so afraid to face their own death um, that they don't have a will. Or they're so afraid to talk about their own death that they don't have an advanced directive. If you are an adult sitting in sanctuary this morning and you do not have a will or an advanced directive, I cannot encourage you enough to reach out and begin that process um, it's so important, and it's something that can really help ease your mind a little bit about what may happen in an uncertain future. You know, another thing that you can do, um, if you're afraid about those that you might leave behind, one of the things that we've done to kind of ease our fear in that is we got some life insurance. I have some life insurance, and my wife has some life insurance. Uh, we hope that that life insurance is never used, and it's not a ton of money, um, and we know it's not going to replace us and our presence in either one of our lives or our children's lives. But, you know, if something happens to us while our children are still growing up, um, it's enough money to get them through their education, to get them started on their journey of life. It's enough just to take care of those basic things. And, and while I certainly um, do not want to leave my kids or my <laughs> wife anytime soon, knowing that if something happens to me, there's a little bit of financial security there, and it turns down a lot of the fears um, I have uh, about my death. Um, and that really helps. It's important, you see, that we talk about these things. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in formal, sit-down kind of ways. Uh, we were at the Oldham County Clerk 
uh, and Ethan was getting his unrestricted license. And, and, and you know this, if you go and you're getting your license, one of the questions they ask you is, do you want to be an organ donor? And you know, my 18-year-old son looks at me and goes, Dad, do I want to be an organ donor? And I was like, no, actually you don't, for obvious reasons, but if you, but, but, right? If something happens to you, son, the biggest gift you can give someone else is the gift of life through your organs. And you're not going to need them in heaven, buddy. Um, and so if something happens to you or something happens to me, we have the opportunity to give life to someone. No, we don't want that to happen. But if something happens and, and, and you're able to give someone else life, then yes, we want that. He said, Dad, you know, Dad, are, are you an organ donor? I said, yeah, buddy. I've, I've, I've been signed up to be an organ donor since I could do it on my driver's license. So he turns to the person and says, I want to be an organ donor. He says, all right, sign here. Ethan signs there. You see, it doesn't have to be a big, profound, hard conversation. But in that moment, if I'm so afraid to talk about death, if I'm, if I'm so worried about how it's going to land on my son, then maybe in that moment, he's too scared of death himself to sign that, to sign that right? And so it doesn't, it doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. But we need to be able to talk about it. Because if we don't talk about it, it's just going to stay buried. and It's not going to help us there. We need to bring it to the surface and we need to bring it to life. Just a quick side note um, that, they, that they, they asked some people to talk about their death. And, and we learned something really valuable when they asked some, uh, this, these two groups to talk about um, their own death. The first group that they asked to write about it, it was actually they asked them to write about it. The first group that they asked to write about it was people who've been given a terminal, Ill, they've been given a terminal diagnosis. They know that their window of life is closing um, and they know that they have limited time. The other group was a group that, that they did not have a terminal illness diagnosis. Now, we know life is unpredictable, and we don't know what tomorrow will bring. Uh, but for them, every expectation was that, that, that their window was going to be open longer than the other group. And so what they did was they asked both groups. We want you to write about um, your life. We want you to write about your death. And so both groups began to journal, and they began to journal about their, um, uh, their, their, uh, their death, and they began to journal about their life. What they found was that between the two groups, the group that had been given a terminal diagnosis, their language about death and their language about life was far more positive than the group um, that hadn't been given a terminal diagnosis. The people who were just asked to imagine their death. The, the words and the language that they used to write was far more fearful, worrisome, um, scary, negative. The people who were actually facing their death was far more positive, hopeful, life-filled, um, and affirming. Now, there's a lot of reasons why this may be the case, um, but one of the things that they figured out um, was that the people who know that their life is coming to, to an end and they know that their window is closing and they've got a limited amount of time left, um, they were really embracing life, right? Everything they did, they were not taking for granted. Every single relationship, every single conversation, every single meal, um, every single encounter, every single thing they saw of beauty in God's world, they were taking all of it in and they were holding on to all of it and they were thankful and they were appreciative. And so even as their life was drawing to a close, they were experiencing a fullness of life that gave them hope. While the other group, they were not focusing on those things. And here's, here's, one of the, here's one of the lessons that it, that it, that it reminds me of. Um, as I've sat and talked with people um, who are, who are, who are uh, facing their death, um, they really are appreciative of what they've got. They're not taking it for granted. And what I've learned is that, you know the kinds of things that keep us up at night? The kinds of things that worry us, the kinds of things that cause us grief and angst and anxiety and fear and all those kinds of things that we tend to stew on? Those are not the kinds of things that people are focused on at the end of life. Half of the stuff that's keeping you up at night right now isn't going to matter for you when, when, you start to, when the window of your life starts to draw closed. That stuff's going to fade away. And so one of the things that they talk about is in the midst of that, in the moment of that, we are called to start living our lives with the recognition of our own death right now. Yeah, our window, it may be open for quite some time. It may be open for quite a long time. But at some point in time, friends, our window is going to close. And according to what they've, what they've found out through the studies and the things that they've done is that the more we live in appreciation of the things we have right now, the things that really matter, the things that make life beautiful, 
the less we fear death because we've embraced life to its fullness right now. You know, the last thing I'll say about, about, about talking about death is conversation that I have with people um, who are nearing the end of their life and they want to play in the memorial service. You may think, wow, that's, that's, that's kind of a depressing conversation, but I'm, I'm here to tell you it's one of the most beautiful conversations you'll ever experience with another person. Um, now, you know, we don't rush into that. We don't tell people we're looking forward to that moment and all, we don't want to do that. But when someone comes and they say, hey, pastor, I want to sit down and I want to talk to you about my memorial service, I say, absolutely, let's do that. And we sit down and we talk about, we tell, me your, tell me your favorite scripture passages and why. Well, what's, what songs that we sing or don't, what are the songs that speak to your life? Tell me some of the stories that you want, uh, that you want to be told and, and to help us remember you by. Um, tell us a little bit about how you want this to play out and what you want to see. And do you want to be buried? Do you want to, do you want to be cremated? Do you want to have your service in the church or do you want to have it outside or somewhere else? How is it that you want this to come together? And in, in doing that, this is what happens almost universally at the end of that conversation. After everything's been written down and we've got it and, and I'm done and I say, ah, we've got it. Is there anything else we need to talk about? The person just kind of takes a deep breath and then just sighs. Just, I'm so glad I did that. I thought it was going to be hard, but it feels really good to know what's going to happen. Thank you. You see, sometimes even the most difficult conversations that we think we're going to have turn out to be life-affirming and life-giving. I know, you're, I know it's, 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 it's perfectly normal to be afraid of death. <clears throat> perfectly normal. We need to name those things and we need to talk about those things so that we can find hope and courage in the midst of them. Um, as Christians, one of the hopes that we have is the promise of eternal life through the grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and we believe, uh, as one theologian once said it, that the worst thing is not the last thing for us, right? Um, when our life ends, it's not a period, it's a comma. When our life ends, we're not running into a wall, we're opening a door. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about um, the Apostle Paul. Uh, Adam Hamilton, in his book by this same title, as he talks about this, uh, he points to the Apostle Paul. And I love, I, Paul, sometimes Paul really aggravates me. Um, but, but Paul, he had an amazing faith journey, right? So here's a guy who, for the first part of, of his encounter with Christianity, he was a persecutor of the Christian faith, right? His job was to persecute and kill Christians, he oversaw the death and murder of Christians. He hated Christians and Christianity and the whole faith. He wanted it to go away. But then something happened. Paul had an encounter with the resurrected Christ. And that encounter was so real and so profound that it turned persecutor into a man who was willing to be persecuted even to the point of death so that he could share the good news message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He knew the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he knew it so profoundly and so deeply that he changed his entire life and dedicated his entire life to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ so that others may know the hope that he had found, that they may believe what he knew. And, and there's this language that Paul uses when he talks to his community of faith about how we can see eternal life in a way that gives us hope. And it's a way that would have, been, it would have resonated with his community in a way uh, far, more deeper than, far more deeply than it does for ours. He talks about the body as a clay jar, a, 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 an earthen vessel. Um, and, and this is the way it worked back in the day. Um, anything that was of value, they would put in clay jars. Food, water, um, valuable things, valuable possessions. They all went into these clay jars. They were kind of like the ancient version of Ziploc, right? So they, they put everything into those things. You, you, like if you've had some of those plastic Ziploc things, right? They break, um, they leak, they do things you don't want. When you're done doing it, what do you do? You throw it away, you recycle it, and you get another one, right? You keep the valuable that was inside it, and you just put it in another one. That's the way they operated. They put their valuables in these clay jars, in these clay pots, knowing that those clay pots were going to break, and when they did, they were just going to get another clay pot and put their valuable in that clay pot. This is the reason why when you go to archaeological sites, ancient archaeological sites, what's the thing that they find more than anything else? Clay pots. Shards and shards of clay pots. They're everywhere, right? It's not that the clay pots were without value. But the real value wasn't in the pot. The real value was within what is inside of the pot. And that's what Paul was trying to say to the people. Look, this is an earthly vessel. It's a clay vessel. It's going to degrade. It's going to fall apart. And eventually it's going to break. And, and, and we know it's important to you. We know your body is. But the real value is not the vessel. 
It's what's inside. The real value is the soul that God has given you, that soul that is inside that vessel. And when your earthly vessel breaks down, that valuable thing is still there. And it's still a value and it is still very much alive. This, this, this is the words, these are the words that he uses in 2 Corinthians. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day for this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but what it cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. This body that you and I see, this body that you're looking at, this body, these bodies that I'm looking at, it's all temporary, friends. Right? It doesn't mean you're not of value. You are, your bodies are valuable. But the real thing is that invisible thing that we can't see, that thing that is inside, and that thing that is inside you is eternal. Um, this is why when Jesus was facing his own death and, and, his, and his disciples were afraid of what was to come for him and what was to come for them, um, he comforted them with these words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that, that where I am, there you may be also. And, and I know that this passage is kind of cliched, but how can we talk about the love of God and the promise of eternal life without turning to the third chapter of the Gospel of John? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now, these promises of Scripture, I recognize that they're, that they're words on a page, um, and sometimes we might struggle to believe them, um, but I turn to them, and they give me hope, and they give me comfort, and they turn down the fears that I have about death, and, and my hope for you is, is that they'll do the same, because these promises are true. And they're waiting for us to realize them and to experience them. Um, I, I want to I close with, with one more story. And it's, um, it, it's a story that, that I just think describes what, you know, kind of what it means for us to be thinking about life after death and what it looks like for us. Um, there's a, uh, there's a, an old doctor, and he, he was going, he was making his rounds. And uh, This is way back in the day we had to go by horse and buggy. So he's out making uh, visits, horse and buggy. He's got his dog with him. Um, and he, he takes his dog with him in these visits, and he, he ends up at this, this house. And, and inside the house is a man who is dying. He's nearing the end of his life, and he's, he's alone. And the doctor goes in to see his patient, and as he goes into the, as he goes into the house, he leaves his dog on the, on, the, on the porch because the dog is not allowed inside. So he closes the door, leaves his dog on the porch to wait for him there. And he goes inside, and he spends time with his patient, uh, caring for him and talking with him. And as part of the conversation, um, his patient says, you know, I'm, I'm, Doc, I'm really afraid of what's next. I'm afraid of what's to come. I don't know what heaven looks like. I, I don't know what it's going to be like um, when I'm there. I, I don't know what's going to happen for me, and I'm just really worried, and I'm concerned about it. And as they listened, and as, as he was telling the doctor about his fears of dying and of being dead, um, uh, the dog that was outside starts scratching on the door, right? And I don't know if you, if, you, if you ever have a dog that you put outside who lets you know that they want to come inside by scratching on the door. Well, the longer you leave them out there, the more assertively they scratch, <laughs> right? And so the dog is outside, and the dog is just scratching on the door, scratching on the door, scratching on the door. The dog wants nothing more than, than for them to open that door. And he tur the doctor turns to the man that's there, and he says, you know what, my dog has never been in your house. He has no idea what lies beyond the other side of that door. He doesn't know if this is a safe place or a dangerous place. He doesn't know anything at all about this place. All he knows is that his master is on this side of the door, and there's nowhere he would rather be than on the side of the door where his master is to be found. Now look, I, I don't know what heaven looks like. Unfortunately, Scripture really doesn't say a lot about it, right? It's, it's kind of mysterious. This is what I believe. It's what I'm counting on. That when I get through that process of getting dead and, and I move to the other side of death, my Savior is going to greet me there. And he's going to take me to that place that God has set aside for me. That room that God has set aside for you as well. And if it wasn't true, Jesus wouldn't have said that he was going there to prepare that place. But he's prepared that place. And, and when our time comes, he meets us in that moment and he takes us to that place. Now, I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what's there. All I know 
is that my Savior's there. And where he is is where I want to be. Not tomorrow. Not before it's time. But when it's time, I know I'm going to be okay because he's going to be there with me. That's the promise of our faith. And so with that promise, even in the face of an uncertain world, including our own mortality, we can live with courage and hope because we know the worst thing is not the last thing. In fact, it's just the beginning. Amen.